Welcome to Teachers Teaching Teachers. It is the 5th of March, uh, 2014, and um, we have invited us again, <laughs> I like to say. So we have a, a, somebody who's a brand new teacher on Youth Voices. Um, Chris Sloan and I started this uh, adventure oh, 10 years ago, maybe a little longer by now. Um, and then uh, we have some other teachers somewhere in between. And our topic tonight is uh, research, I think. And so here's, and we're, let's do quick introductions because there are some faces here who I know that other, you may not know each other. So I really want, I'm excited to get you all to meet each other. Um, so this is our welcoming party for Lisa. Lisa, do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Lisa, did you hear me? Lisa Rockford? No. She Rocket doesn't frozen. seem to be hearing me. Okay, so we'll work on that. We'll come back and it will come back to the beginning and, and introduce them all. Hello, them all. Introduce yourself, hi. please. Um, hi, my name is Amal. I teach a uh, 10th grade writing class in the Bronx. Um, I've been using Youth Voices with my students. I think this is my third year using it with them. Um, and I, uh, I love it. I do. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and say the name of your school. Because my school is University Prep Charter High School. University Prep Charter High School. In the Bronx. Yeah. So very cool. And Charlie, welcome. Oh, Introduce me. yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I'm um, Charlie. I, I teach now at uh, East Brooklyn Community High School in the uh, uh, Brownsville section of Brooklyn. Uh, I've been working, I guess it's almost five years now, <laughs> with Youth Voices on and off at times. I don't get to teach the same thing very, very often, so I, uh, I, will, I, will, I will rejoin the community whenever I get the opportunity. I teach a lot of English, mostly, but I will teach... Uh, Theater and technology at times, and whatever else your relatively yeah, I've, small I've also, school wants. Yes, right? exactly. Yeah. I've also taught French and Spanish and some other things. Speaking neither. <laughs> and your your it is a transfer school. Is it is correct? a transfer high school? So mm -hmm. overaged, undercredited. <laughs> cool. Chris Sloan. Hi, um, my name is Chris Sloan, and I teach English and media. For high school students at Judge Memorial in Salt Lake City, Utah, and uh, yeah, I have a lot of good things to say about Youth Voices and how it's transformed my teaching through the years. Well, you've transformed us. So anyway, wow. all right, <laughs> enough Academy Award kind of talk. <laughs> hey, right. um, Grafina. Hi. Hi. Um, how are you? How are you, Paul? Good. We can hear you fine, even if we, even if we can't see you so well. Why don't you introduce <laughs> yourself, though? Okay, um, my name is Grafina Blake. I teach at Choir Academy um, Alternative Learning Center, and I'm also doing um, credit recovery for Bronx Lab High School in the Bronx. And are you students on Youth Voices yet, or you're aiming to get them on? Well, I'm aiming to get them on. I have, um, you know, different ones, but I'm doing an 11th grade credit recovery class, and we ha we've been talking a lot about um, utopias and dystopias, and they have some stuff that they would like to share. Cool. Welcome. Joe. Um, okay. Hi. Um, Joe Pariso. Uh, I teach in the Fruitvale, East Oakland at Fremont High, and um, I've, we've only been on Youth Voices officially, I think, for a full year now. Um, and this is a class, a 12th grade class that I looped with, um, so this is my second year with them. So the work on Youth Voices is very powerful, and we've just made a lot of friends that we can <laughs> talk about, um, <laughs> especially for the kids to have an audience for their senior research, and also just a forum for our other partners in Oakland um, to be able to look at the work of our school. Uh, Youth Voices is a really great site for them to go to to see what our kids are doing publishing. Right. Very easy. And um, as we introduce Lisa and Paul, and we'll get back um, <laughs> to you, Karen. Um, we want to we want to say that both you and Lisa Rothberg 
Rothberg, yes? Yes. Are, are in the education, EDDA, uh, what is that again? It's uh, edu Educating, Educating for, for democracy, democracy in the Digital Age. The digital age which, yeah. which we'll mention and talk about as we go here as well. Lisa, do you, do you want to try your mic? Uh, Wait, perfect. Okay. Sorry, Good. I'm having some connection problems, so it keeps cutting in and out. You're good now. Well, she was good now. That's hmm. what you get for being in a hotel in Boston <laughs> waiting for DML to happen. But that's okay. Hey, Paul, do you want to introduce yourself and say something about Lisa? <laughs> Is he in pause, too? Paul, are you there? there hey, you everyone, go. yes. Um, I also am having connection issues, and uh, just to explain, Lisa and I are at the Digital Media and Learning Conference in Boston, uh, operating on a hotel Wi-Fi, so that could be part of the issue. I'm sure that is the issue. And um, I will just say quickly, um, first of all, it's great to be here. My name is Paul O. I'm with the National Writing Project. Um, I personally hate youth voices. <laughs> just kidding. Love youth voices. I'm glad you do. Yes. And I am, I've been a huge proselytizer of the use of youth voices among our Educating for Democracy in the Digital Age um, initiative. And uh, I can talk more about that uh, in a little bit. Don't want to take up too much time because it, you know, is I think more important to hear from the practitioners who are actually putting this into action mm -hmm. in their classrooms. Karen, introduce yourself, please. Then we'll, I have a couple of questions for you. <laughs> Hi, I'm Karen. I'm part of Borderlands Writing Project, and I'm a big fan of Youth Voices, and sometimes do some work in the background helping people set up school pages and stuff like that. It's great to have you do that. This your expression. So, okay, so research and inquiry. Um, I, here's why I wanted to invite you all here. I think we are do very similar things, but we do different things, and I'm interested in both the similarities and the differences. Um, so what I'd like to start with, and so let me identify first that I think, and somebody else can help me with this, but what we've learned over the years is the research project can be something that you pr make things for along the way. You don't wait till the end to, to start putting things online, to start getting feedback, to start thinking with other people. Um, and so that's one way to talk about what, how we use youth voices. Um, but I want to talk, if we could begin, well, just, yeah, let's begin with how do you start? How do you, we like to say that we start with interest-based work. So could we just kind of go around and talk about how you start? Um, and then some other thoughts I, I have down the line is, um, like what's really, really important for you in this research process that, that you, th you think must happen? Um, all right, so, but let's just talk about how you start. Because, uh, sorry, let me say one more thing. Um, so people who are, are close to me here in New York kind of use some of the same ideas and thoughts, but um, people who are further away come up with their own ways of doing things. So. Is, is that, first of all, is that difference and similarity an interesting enough way to approach this? I think so, yeah? Mm -hmm. Anybody, any thoughts? Okay. So how do you start? How do you, how do you get kids to, to really find an interest, to define their topic, to decide what they're going to explore? And please jump in. We're not going to go in any kind of orders. What, and what do you like about it? What do you wonder about it? Come on, don't be shy. Okay, fine. Fine, Good. fine. Good job. <laughs> uh, um, uh, so, deep in the east, Oakland area, it, <laughs> a lot of it is, uh, because we teach it in the senior English class, and again, I was blessed because I get, I've gotten to loop with this set of students, um, we have to find a way to accommodate, for us it's a graduation requirement, so and then it's separate from every other graduation requirement. So it's actually trying to do two graduation requirements in one. So having had to negotiate that for a decade now, um, you have to find a way to have it fit into your normal English, your senior English curriculum. And in our case, um, or in my class, we definitely take a social equity focus because our community is ripe with equity issues. They abound everywhere. So it's a lot. It's a very easy to make connections. 
to what's going on uh, right outside. Um, so we study all of our texts through uh, critical lenses, and then we use those same lenses of uh, feminism, Marxism, colonialism, and psychoanalysis, and we use the same lenses when we approach the research project. So when they eventually, they do choose their own topics, um, and they start with self. Uh, so as seniors, you know, they, there's a lot of hype about the senior project, so when they get there, they understand that um, from jump, uh, the even the choosing of the topics, they get to own that, but they have to choose something weighty that ha has them representing a demographic, of which most of them, they're a part of that demographic they're researching. All they're doing is broadening that their self and whatever that challenge is that they're facing in the community and trying to take it to that to a level where they're representing you know an entire group of people so they can bring in their background knowledge but um, and they they're personally tied to it so they because it takes eight months and it's like giving birth they have to be willing to stay engaged with it so that's why the, the choice part is really important and what's the most important part well, right at this point don't you blow can, there yet. You can go there, but let's. You said a lot already. Let's uh, let's. Yeah, cool. Let's hit on um on some of your thoughts around what Joe just presented. That was that's wonderful. I mean, just to hear from me, it's 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 fun to hear someone who had the complete opposite experience. <laughs> uh, we don't have seniors, so you know we'll get student. I'll have, get a student in my class that's been with us maybe for two years, but then some a student that will be just this will be their third week, and so there isn't anything that sort of builds up to when they get to me and they first meet Youth Voices. So I actually have to sort of sell them on the idea that they can have a choice and that choice is valid, and it will help them not only in life, <laughs> which is my selling point, but I also in the back of my mind I have to sell them on this will also help on the Regents and the other sort of mercenary aspects of credits and that sort Which of thing. Which is our so, state test, yeah. So the, so the first few weeks are really a lot of activities engaged around validating questions that they have um, and then you, you, know, you start to really suss out the divide in the, in the reading and sort of cognitive. Some students are coming in very curious about the world and already experienced doing research and some just want a worksheet and really don't trust the computer or anything that doesn't have a clear ending. And so that's generally how I begin and uh, some of the difficulties that I, I see going forward. That helps? So it's absolutely great. I um, good start there. Please uh, don't wait for me to ask questions to each other. Please, uh, you know, yeah. As you've now heard two kind of people get started. Oh, no. what's it make um, you all think about? But let's hey, so let's stay on those two for now. Go ahead, Chris. Well, um, why don't we hear from Caitlin, who's uh, new and just joined Youth Voices, I believe. Uh, kind of introduce herself and maybe. That's right. Sorry. Thank you very much. Chris. By the way, if you have the broadcast on, you want to turn that off. Go ahead, Caitlin. Do you want to introduce yourself? And then, if you haven't figured it out yet, we just talk over each other and, and interrupt. But, <laughs> Caitlin, are you there? Not yet. Okay. Her audio so we we'll have to get to that according to one of the texts. Um. Well, yes. you know. Go ahead, Chris. I'll talk about how I have students get into it because um, I've used Youth Voices with ninth graders, and then uh, now I have uh, my senior students use it. So there's a lot of crossover with um, Joe's students and hopefully um, others as well. Uh, but basically, it's it starts with curiosity because they're such curious people, and um, and then they should. Um, do some reading around their curiosity and so the their writing is usually tied to the kinds of things they're um, thinking about while they're reading or the kinds of things that the reading makes them think about uh, and that's where then um, like Joe's students and mine have found a lot of crossover a lot of connections coincidentally one of Joe's students just um, Text or you know uh, sent me a little chat here saying could you take my survey 
Um, <laughs> and so I'm actually talking to one of Joe's students in Oakland, and I live in Utah, uh, because I think he wants to have my students take a survey of his. So, you know, there's my class, how they use it, and then there's also how my class connects with uh, the other teachers in the community too that they find really uh, fascinating and motivating. So I'm hearing a couple things I'd love for everyone to see touch touch on. Um, social equity, how important is that in the curiosity? Like how do you guide toward kids toward that? Or is it not that important? Or you know how you think about it? And then um, questions, how you use questions at the beginning. Hi, Tommy. Buto. Welcome. I actually go to the social equity angle when students mm -hmm. are struggling. Uh, if they're struggling forming questions, that's when I usually say, like, what makes you mad? And mm -hmm. that at least provokes usually some sort of, uh, you know, reaction. And then, you know, we really try and think about why and get the questions going based on that. So they're like, what do you, you know, what makes you mad or, or what do you love? And then that gets mm -hmm. them going. Um, mm -hmm. I'd love to get more social. I would love to have just a, a designated Marxist section of my curriculum. <laughs> Joanne, I'm, I'm insanely jealous. Well, how does that go, Joanne? It is, is, I mean, is it easy enough to hold on to social equity? I'm sorry, hold on to self when you're pushing toward the bigger sort of community social issues? I think so. I mean, the kids appreciate, because they get to talk about a larger group, then sometimes they they can examine it from that very individual, personal, um, sometimes it's really uncomfortable because they're still exploring it level. And they do that in their writing, and that's their more private notebook like that they have with, you know, with me. But then they also have, when they have to do it in their research, and they're representing, they're responsible for representing a group. Um, and speaking for that group because part of the objective in the research is to find a small solution, then it is, they can do both. I think we found, we're finding, we're constantly trying to find the balance between being able to talk about it um, from a broad perspective. So sometimes they write pieces of their research paper in the I perspective and, and it just gets it out and then they find that, that evidence to back it up which I think that's what Youth Voices has been great for, was the, the kids responding back and forth to each other and challenging each other on a little bit more on some of their sources um, also keeps them engaged beyond the, beyond the, 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 the actual topic, just this mm -hmm. action of being able to talk to others. And, and Paula, can I just jump in? This is Paula. Yes, go ahead. We can as hear you. Someone, yeah, as, as someone who has been working with um, Caitlin and Lisa in, in getting their kids established at Youth Voices, I think one of the things that um, is just true and intrinsically true, and perhaps we may forget um, if we've been on Youth Voices for a long time, is that uh, everything, I, I, I would argue that everything that kids do at Youth Voices is tied up with identity. Um, so, you know, the very first activity that Caitlin and Lisa um, have decided to engage in, and they can talk more about this in terms of what they're thinking or how it went, um, you know, is this notion of uh, completing your profile. And so just that act, I think, causes kids to think about, you know, so what, what is the identity that I'm putting forward in this public uh, space uh, in which I will be engaging with others? And then I think every, every interaction that these kids have in Youth Voices uh, is, I think, by default, tied up with that identity that either they have or that they're trying to create or formulate or are, you know, reimagining. And worth, worth, worth pointing out, and I'd love for Caitlin and Lisa to jump in whenever you can here, but um, worth pointing out is that I think um, Shantanu Saha just joined us. Welcome, Shantanu, or joined us here briefly um, and just a while ago. And I, Shantanu, I don't, I don't know if your kids do uh, profiles yet, and I know, Chris, your students do very brief profiles, and I don't think, so, but Amal does pretty intense ones, and I, my students do pretty intense ones, so how that works is is worth identifying. Amal, do you want to talk to about the profile and what you do as you're introducing yourself? and yeah. Um, yeah, well, with my students, they're they're in the 10th grade, and they haven't had a class 
that kind of challenges their curiosity yet. I think most of the classes at our school are very like test happy and they end up, you know, passing the regents really solidly, etc. Um, and so a lot of it for me is teaching them about being curious and just I mean the hardest thing for them at the beginning is thinking about what do they want to know and just kind of thinking about like the questions that Charlie was just saying are really challenging for them and a lot of it is um, getting them to be present online and getting them to kind of engage and think about how they want to present themselves and what that means to kind of engage and be part of a community and it's not really Instagram, you know, it's kind of a different thing for them. And so a lot of that for me is kind of getting them into that place where they are ready to be learners and collaborators and curious people who can have a conversation with strangers about the things that they're interested in. And so the profiles for me is um, a way to get them to kind of put a voice and put in writing kind of who they are and what they want to know um, as a way to kind of present themselves. and. I find that having more structure has been more successful just because of the different levels that my students have. Um, and so I've, I've gone with the guides a lot that are on Youth Voices already, um, and I found a lot of success with them. They're just flexible enough to kind of give students mm -hmm. structure and, and choice. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I start with, and uh, just to mention this, if you go to youthvoices.net slash questions, you can see more about this. But James A. Bean's notion of starting a middle school curriculum is what he designed um, with 10 self, 10 world questions. 10 questions about yourself, 10 about the world. Um, but Amal, could you talk, and, and you, I obviously looking at your kids who are, who have been posting over the last couple of weeks a lot. Um, with their first response to something. Could you mention some of the topics that they're, they've come up with and how do they get from their 10 self, 10 world to their topic? Um, well, you know, that's a good question. We, um, we do the 10 self and 10 world questions and then I have a running Google document that we started at the very beginning of the year that just asks questions or brings up topics and it just lists all of the random things that students bring up throughout the day, um, sometimes at lunch, sometimes in advisory, and sometimes we'll be talking about like, oh yeah, the mafia, and then we'll switch topics to like, what's up with artichokes? You know, it's just kind of across, like all over the place, and I just keep a list of those, and that's shared with all of the students, and they comment um, on that's, it periodically. That's, that's, you use one doc for that? I use one doc that's shared with the entire 10th grade. Wow. Um, and they can kind of keep coming back to that. And so when they were deciding on their topics, they were between their the questions they wrote, their self and world questions, and then they were all over that document, which just you know grew, and now it has like 200 things on it, which could all be pretty great research topics. Um, and a lot of them have sort of you know been navigating how to turn these curiosities into research topics because. Sometimes it's a yes or no question, and sometimes it's something that has a very straightforward answer, and other times it's a very complex thing that could, you know, have multifarious responses and ideas and perspectives. And so um, it's been really fun working with them on that, and they're just getting started, and they've never done anything really um, in, in this vein. So um, it's, it's been really good to kind of develop that curiosity with them. I'm 100% stealing that idea. Just oh, you totally should. It's, it's solid, yeah. Do you mean the Google Doc idea? Yeah, the, just the random, the, I mean, the, you know, if I could, I just need to come up with a good strategy for recording the, the number of random questions I get a day. Yeah. I love it. Yeah, I hadn't done it before this year, and I really, uh, it turned into a huge success. The kids are all over it. And what's interesting, and, and relating back to what uh, I wrote down when Joe was talking, is that there's a private with the teacher. Um, I don't know if you do it on Docs or how you do it, Joe, but um, conversation that happens before the more public on Youth Voices. And is that true with most of us that uh, we're using both that more notebooky place? We're using Docs for that, and then we go to Youth Voices. Any thoughts Absolutely on that? for me. Um, my students are really self-conscious uh, on the internet right now, especially because um, 
they got they got really like judgy on youth voices when they first started writing comments, which is how I get them. And um, some of them would point out like spelling errors or grammar mistakes, and then kind of turned it back on themselves, like, oh my gosh, what if somebody thinks I'm an idiot, you know? And then they freaked out a little bit about that. So there's a lot of um, you know, it's just like very motivated proofreading has happened because they want to make sure they present themselves well. Um, and they're teenagers, so they care deeply about this. And um, that's been like really positive because they want me to check it and they want each other to check it and they're trying to find a better word for that. And is this the right way to say that? Or is, you know, and that's been really, um, you know, kind of personal challenges for them that have been really good. Yeah, I wanted to jump on that um, kind of public-private uh, writing because um, typically a class day, I'll have them, you know, let's say um, the other day we searched Twitter for um, links that would be related to our um, inquiry questions. And so in a Google Doc, they started gathering their thoughts as they came across these resources. Um, and then at the end of class, what I'll say is now compose... Uh, create a youth voices discussion based on the most interesting thing you found in your reading today. And so that's why a lot of times you'll see um, some of my students will say, like, the most interesting thing I found on Twitter today. Um, but I think that's a way to kind of um, give them a chance to distill a lot of the stuff that's coming at them and then um, go public with something. They have some choices about w what they could do on that. Mm -hmm. And then go, just go one last thing. And then the other thing is whenever they do that, I always say then you have to comment on somebody else's uh, youth voices discussion too. Yeah, so um, and which is worth noting that Amal um, kind of said that very quickly that you have students start by commenting. Yes? Mm -hmm. um, so I, I just want to make sure, Grafina, we can't see your face. So we oh. don't know if you want to talk or not. So, but go ahead and just jump in at any point. We see the fan there. Now we see you. Yeah, I'm here. Okay. No, okay. I, I, think, I think um for the uh, class that I have now at Bronx Lab, what I've been trying to get them to do, I had them do their profiles and um their questions, but. What I've been asking them to do more is to reflect on the the different topics that we've been talking about in class, and I'm trying to move them towards them actually writing their reflections on youth voices, because they have um they have a lot of uh, different opinions about the, the stuff that's happening, because we've been looking at stuff such as cloning and um. The, the GMOs in, in food and how they feel about, you know, organic versus um, genetically modified food. We've been looking at cloning, how now you're able to choose the sex of your child. And they really have strong opinions, and I would like them to be able to, to voice that on youth voices and then get the feedback from what they're putting on there. Because what I've found that out when I've used youth voices in the past is that it's empowering for them when they see other people read their writing and respond to them. That's something that they, I think, you know, the kids that I service really don't see that much of. Lisa, can you jump in? Are you there? Uh, sure, sorry. Yeah, we can hear you. So why don't you talk a little bit about who you're teaching, what you're teaching, and, and and talk about how the research project, or how you're starting to think about getting involved with youth voices in general. Sure. sure. Um, so I'm at Skyline High School in Oakland, and I teach 10th and 11th grade English in um, an education academy at my school. And my students are, my juniors, are starting a research project um, that's focused on civil rights, and so I ask them to think about um, issues that could be considered civil rights issues of our time, and they have to, they get to study um, topics that, you know, are of interest to them in small groups, and we do a lot of focus on finding relevant sources, finding credible sources, um, corroborating information, etc. And I'm just starting uh, 
to introduce them to youth voices and I'm just I'm super fresh on it too I'm just becoming introduced to it um, while I'm in Boston right now for this conference my students are hopefully completing a draft of their youth voices profile um, with the substitute and then next week we'll be getting on the laptops to get them online um, so what have you asked them to do on that profile so well what I've done, something that I've, I've incorporated into my teaching a lot over the years that I think is a really nice build up to this is I play a lot of personal commentaries for them from KQED. So KQED is our local um, NPR radio station and um, they have their listener perspective uh, piece. And there's a program called Youth Radio that I think has some sort of a partnership with KQED because they get a lot of... Um, they help a lot of teens publish uh, two-minute commentary pieces. So throughout the year, they are listening to these, analyzing these, connecting with these, and I think it's been a really nice um, kind of like connection piece to say, you know, this is kind of like another online platform for you to share your voice. So um, that's kind of like one buildup. And then just before I left I showed them the Youth Voices website and I actually, Joe, I, I showed them the Fremont page and um, they saw the, the, the page with all of your students names and, and a bunch of them knew some of your kids and they started shouting out which names they wanted me to click on and um, it was really fun and I just pulled up some profiles and showed them you know this is kind of like their initial profile and then you can see all of the posts that, they, that they've put up there and the comments that they've gotten on them so it's super fresh um, I just copied the the writing a profile guide from um, from the website and added just made a few tweaks to it and just asked them to write you know three paragraphs and then I also asked them to write um, a draft of their first blog post explaining uh, the th their top three research topics of choice and why they chose them and some other kind of guiding questions with that. Welcome. Um, Thank you. Looking forward to seeing your kids work. Caitlin, I, I have a question for you. Please jump in, Tommy. Is, is that and we'll the, get to Caitlin in a second. Go ahead. I was Tommy listening Bateau. to... Uh, uh, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't catch her name, but the, the last woman that was speaking from Oakland. That was Lisa. Uh, yes. Lisa. Is that mm -hmm. the Youth Radio Perspectives Archive? Because I'm interested in that. It's just so, on K KQED. Yeah, I think so. So KQED has a broader program just called Listener Perspectives. Mm -hmm. So anyone can write in a two-minute piece and submit it to be aired. And then Youth Radio, um, you know, actively works to get more youth voice up in that program. Okay, that looks interesting. I'm going to uh, check that out because I think my students would, because uh, I'm in Colorado, and so I'm always looking for places where they can hear perspectives from students that are in different parts of the country. So that that might work out great for me. Yeah. Just a quick tech note, um, if you can have the students make it at MP3, uh, if, they're, if they're producing stuff like this themselves, um, it's very easy to upload an MP3 to Youth Voices. Um, and then it just plays right on the top of, of any post on Youth Voices. So I used to do that a lot more. I, I used to have students actually read their posts and put, put up an audio of, what, of their posts as well. And what happens over time when, when you do that is that they start to write in a more kind of... They, if they know they're going to be speaking it, they, they write like they're talking more. Um, which which is an interesting little piece that happens with that. So there there are those options available. Caitlin, are you still there? <laughs> it's funny you mention that, Paul. I'm actually doing a Go lot ahead, yeah. of uh, talk to type with my students. So in the latest Mac software, they now have dictation pretty much across everything. I know the PCs have had it on Microsoft Word for a minute, but um, it's been very, very useful for a lot of students to get into the... So what's that look like? What do you it's do? A, it's a, on a Mac, you turn enable it, and then they can tap on the button, and they will sort of their ideas out. Uh, if they're really advanced, they could talk out and say, period, and then it'll like 
put in punctuation. <laughs> um, and you no, know, so usually, like you said, uh, the reason I thought of it is you will get a draft that is just like they talk, which a lot of times is is the perfect first draft, like just to get them going and talking. And so the hard part is just finding a quiet enough place for them to, to do this, mm-hmm. uh, especially since they need some sort of faculty member. They can't just send them off into some sort of room by yeah. themselves. All of our classrooms need little sound booths uh, so that kids yeah. can go off and do recordings. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Paul. It's been... Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead. Paul, Paul oh, go ahead. Yeah, you should definitely continue that thread because I just want to pick up on something related to um, related to this uh, project in Oakland. So if you guys want to geek out about audio, please please finish. No, go ahead, Paul. Of course. Jump in. You sure? Okay. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah. So the thing I was going to say is I just want to provide a little bit of um, uh, like sort of um, framework context around some of this work that's happening in Oakland and and how Youth Voices slots in. Um, so. Our, our project is really focused on this notion of civic engagement, um, which I think you all, I'm sure, could relate to. Um, and in thinking about civic engagement, uh, we as a project have, have come up with these three notions of, of how to get to that place. You know, what, what are the components of civic education that relates to civic engagement? You know, one is issue analysis, um, one is taking action, and then the third is reflection. Um, and, the, you know, there are a lot, of, um, a lot of notions that fall under those categories. Um, but the thing that I think is is interesting and that hasn't really come up in this conversation so far or maybe is implied is this notion of taking action. Um, and we see youth voices as as an opportunity for kids to take action. Um, so it's it's both a place to to have a voice. it's it's a place to engage in conversation. but you know, but we see it as as giving kids this opportunity to take action. And so we see this as, part of um, a range of possibilities under this uh, civic engagement framework. Um, so I, I'm just curious to hear what you think about that, um, what, whether that resonates with you or not. Uh, I'm, I'm interested in that. Uh, I'd like to know a little bit more about how you see uh, just participating on Youth Voices as being, uh, uh, being actively engaged. Um, just to hear a little more explanation, because I have a project with my uh, freshmen coming up where they're going to do um, some research on a problem that they see in the world and the goal is to have them try to help solve the problem in some way or other. So I'm just interested in hearing a little bit more about how you think Youth Voices uh, fits into that because that might work perfectly for uh, what I'm doing. Yeah, and I'm, I'm wondering if um, Lisa or Caitlin wants to say something about that and if not, you know, I, I could jump in. I can, uh, Yay! Okay, sorry. sorry. I've been having some technical difficulties, so I don't know no. if you can hear me. We're okay. glad to hear your voice. Go for it. Yes. Um, I think the biggest thing with Youth Voices, the best part about it, is that you're connecting the students with a different audience. So in that sense, it's civic engagement in that they're talking to people across the nation about an issue and getting different viewpoints and then expanding their own worldview. Um, hopefully that pushes them to take some sort of outside action and do something beyond just the communication, but I think that's the starting point, right, is we have to exchange ideas in order to grow and better our own understanding. Um, so that's kind of how I'm, I'm understanding youth voices, is it's, it's a way to connect students and get them to consider ideas um, outside of our sphere or our bubble that we always tend to live in. Yeah, and the only thing I would add to that would be um, you know, at least what I assume is going to happen, what I expect and hope will happen is that there will be a, a real increase in their engagement in the work. I think I heard Joe talking about that earlier. Um, because they have that authentic audience that they're communicating with. Mm-hmm. You know, like last year my students did presentations and I saw the engagement, you know, go up from previous years because they presented in front of a panel of experts that I brought into the room. But those that was, was, that was two days out of the school year, whereas hopefully with youth, youth Voices, it'll be more consistent, more of a regular form of interaction, um, and more of that, uh, yeah, more regularity in terms of having an audience. And, and I'll just jump in and quickly say that I think, you know, ditto to what has been said, and then I also think that if, if we think about 
action as having many steps. You know, as I, mean, I think if we have a nuanced understanding of action, um, you know, one one aspect of action could be thought of as you know, how do we circulate our ideas, or how do we spread our ideas, or our viewpoint, or our perspective? Um, and you know, you voice as a as a web-based publishing platform is one way. And actually, to even push upon that, uh, you know, we might ask our kids, so how how might you uh, generate a campaign around a particular idea um, through youth voices? Um, you know, so for instance, last year, a number of Joe's kids, I believe, wrote letters to the superintendent. Um, so it's one thing to publish those letters, but then the next step would be to then actually have the superintendent read those letters and p perhaps respond. Um, so I think, you know, it's a continuum in this uh, sequence of possibilities with regard to action, um, this idea of publishing at Youth Voices. Um, can I also add to that part of um, that the publishing then leads to the other forums? So like with Chris and I, our kids being able to uh, do a Google Hangout together. So from the blogs came ideas, from the written ideas came, okay, why don't we talk about it and look at each other at the same time? Um, which adds a whole other element to um, the clap, the engagement, and the sharing of ideas. Um, so, which Joe, I can I can I just uh, yeah. announce and just so everyone knows, it it starts just after noon sometime. I get on at noon Pacific time um, on Thursdays, and which is three p.m. Eastern time. So, for me, it's an after-school club, um, and for Joe and and Chris Sloan, it's a uh, so far that's what we've been doing, it's 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 a good time for your classes. So and we could do it other times too. Um, but but go ahead, Joe. I interrupted just to make sure everyone knows that that's one well, place I, we're yeah. starting. Yeah. I just wanted to yeah for, for with Tommy it's it's like a it's like the end and so the kids get to publish and then it's also it's one of the step the, the steps to whatever it is they're trying to do with their research project. So one of our students uh, whose topic is in education started a change.org petition. So she's going to use her Youth Voices blog to post the link to the petition to then generate more of that kind of engagement around. So it's 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 also a forum where the kids can get, like, just do something big, bigger. Um, and we're, that's, so that's that's another way that we kind of, that we use it. I have, I have kind of a technical question for everybody, um, and that is, how often are you uh, taking your classes or getting your classes on the computer? Um, because we're not a one-to-one -one school or anything, so I have to book time in the lab, and that's the problem I'm finding is it's very difficult for me to get a lot of exposure to Youth Voices because I have to book the lab, and I, you know, I can only do that maybe once every few weeks, so that's the glitch I'm running into, and I'm just wondering if other people are in one-to-one -one schools or how that, how you're kind of working that. Um, um, I'm in a one-to-one -one school. Sometimes um, I'll have problems, um, even, you know, we've got fairly good access now, um, and my students can um, compose on their cell phones. A lot of them have smart enough phones that they can actually um, right on those devices. Um, so that's been um, something that on the day our school network goes down, you know, enough of them have data plans that they actually go ahead anyway without my devices. Um, and, and I would just add a couple more things to what people were saying about how we use youth voices in those ways. Um, one thing I'll have my students do a lot of times is instead of posting a discussion on a particular day, I'll say, um, find someone, um, and sometimes I'll start with, we'll go to a school like Fremont and say, if your name is Charlie, look at the students who begin with C, you know, so they don't all start with the letter A student, and letter A student gets 42 comments. Um, and then I'll have them read the students' discussions, and in their comment I'll say, um, I want you to add a resource that you think would help that student with their um, research. And so the forcing people, my own students, to read enough so that they can give a suggestion for a resource to another student, I think is another way we kind of help each other with that civic engagement. Um, yeah, and then uh, one more thing about the hang or the yeah the live hangouts that Paul's talking about. If you want to join in on those, it's really interesting um, because Joe's students are at lunch usually. 
and when we've been doing it, actually it's one of my classes, so it's just like an open um, camera in my class, which adds a different dynamic. Yeah, and we've done, what, I think nine shows, and so we're just starting and trying to figure this out as we go, so if you have other ideas around all that, we're, we're way open to hearing about it. Um, can I, can I, I don't want to, I want to get Shantanu in here. Um, Shantanu, I, can you, ex your, some of your kids who are on there are younger than the high school that we've been talking about so far. Can you explain, is it a baccalaureate project, or what? what is the... Um, work that uh, your students have been doing this around a question. Good. It's well, uh, right now. Introduce uh, yourself first, I should say. I, yeah. go ahead. Uh, I'm Shantanu Saha. I'm uh, the tech teacher at the uh, Baccalaureate School for Global Education in uh, New York City. Uh, and I've been on Youth Voices for several years. I don't even remember how many years at this point I've been on there so long. Uh, uh, but uh, so, uh, you know, this semester, uh, in February, I started uh, uh, teaching uh, the entire seventh grade in my school, so I have 84 kids, uh, and uh, the, the first unit in my technology class is about uh, uh, safety on the internet, and so uh, one of the, uh, you know, so, so we discuss the issues about how to present your identity. How, so, so this is uh, in, uh, you know, another issue about identity, but also uh, since they since they are so young, protecting their identity uh, to the point where they don't want to reveal too too much personal information. And so, uh, the your uh, your kids' icons, by the way, are pretty pretty amazing. Yeah, uh, <laughs> and so and so they create right. avatars of themselves, uh, and that's the, the uh, that's the uh, uh, main thrust of the project, and at the end there, I introduce them to Youth Voices, and we put all uh, the, the students create their accounts and put their avatars up and uh, start to fill out their profiles. But I, I, what I wanted to do was to have them put enough of their identity in their avatars so that they wouldn't have to spend a lot of uh, time writing about their uh, uh, Profiles because they're not really ready yet to to, uh, to uh, write too much personal stuff about themselves without uh, you know uh, uh, getting a little bit too personal. So, but you do get there because they're pretty right. interesting profiles, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just hasn't been the thrust of it. So I, I try to have have them put it in the visuals in the avatar rather mm -hmm. than uh, uh, writing it out. Uh, and we'll, and we'll get there, uh, you know. Uh, uh, and of course, one of the first things that I have them do is start to uh, to read and respond to the other uh, 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 students' posts on Youth Voices. And uh, now that uh, we're uh, the the next project is to uh, we're, uh, working in Scratch, and so they're going to start to uh, put up their Scratch projects uh, on Youth Voices and. Uh, and discuss them and how they made them and so on. So, which are fractured fairy tales again, or uh, no? The, the the first one is going to be a uh, a short story, uh, uh, and then the second one is going to be the interactive uh, fractured fairy tale. Yeah. But Mishanta, you your kids are some of your kids are also doing really interesting research projects. What are, which yes, of those uh, kids? Uh, well, I have a tenth grade advisory, and uh, in the tenth grade in my school, uh, they they have a, a year long personal project that uh, we're we're now in the home stretch of. Uh, they've actually finished their projects, and so uh, we're uh, actually writing about them right now. Uh, but uh, the during especially during the research phase of of the project, uh, I made sure that they would go on to Youth Voices. And uh, as part of uh, their reading and advisory, they would uh, uh, read not only a, non a fiction book, but a nonfiction book that is uh, related to their personal project topic, write about it, uh, put, those, uh, put uh, some of that writing up on Youth Voices, and uh, have, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, they have to uh, have a process journal for their project, and so uh, I give them credit for process journal entries for everything they write up on Youth Voices. So uh, that gets them to write a lot more on Youth Voices than they normally would have. So Shantanu, um, given that you're not an English teacher, you've brought up an interesting issue about where does literature fit when we're doing these year-long projects. And yeah. you just said you have them read literature that's related to the year-long project. Is that right? That's right. Uh, yeah. Specifically in, in the 10th grade. I also have an 8th grade advisory. And uh, uh, they have a sort of uh, a tr a truncated version of what uh, the 10th graders are doing. Uh, uh, so they're free to uh, have their uh, their literacy tasks uh, not based around a single topic, but around any topic that they choose to make and they change the topic uh, uh, once they've finished their literacy tasks around one topic, they can go on to another topic. So it lets them experiment with uh, uh, topics more. All right, I wish I could sit down and talk to each of you individually. I, I feel like there's not enough time here. But um, let, me, let me give one example of, 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 a, of an issue and, um, and then ask you to focus on, like, this is, these are big projects. And I don't know how many else, uh, like, hearing things like year-long project, hearing things like, Joe, your students start in 11th grade, do they, and then go into 12th grade with the project? Um, and it sounds like, Shantanu, you're going to, you might end up seeing some of the same kids later on. I know that's happened in the past. And on uh, if, if, I, if I have uh, some of those 8th graders in my 10th grade advisory in two years, uh, I'm going to uh, remind them of all the work that they did on Youth Voices and, uh, and have them go back and see if they want to mine their work for uh, topics for their personal projects. So, uh, uh, right. So again, I, I I didn't do what I was going to do. So here's here's the one bug. Here's the one thing that that I think is really really important for me. Um, and that that and Chris, when you you said your students read enough in order to be able to suggest an article, I get that. And and I just wonder how often in research projects like this, there's almost an an implied encouragement to just read enough to get something to put into your paper, right? But I really want to teach reading through the process, too, and careful analytical annotations of, of text and sharing the, that reading process with each other. And, and of those of you who know, um, I'm referring to Crocodoc. And so you may or may not have seen, but what I've been doing kind of as a ghost in the background and would love for other people to do too, is taking any kid who cites a, a text, and Amal, your kids are doing a great job of citing their texts, and Chris, your kids are getting better. Sorry, <laughs> anyway, <laughs> this, is, this is me. Anyway, so um, it's then, and then making a PDF of that, of that article or that website, um, which then we put up in Crocodoc, which you know is under the member home, um, so so it's a so, but it's not happening yet too much. So it's, I'm, what my hope of that is that in addition to just commenting on each other's stuff, there could be some collaborative reading going on, so that you know somebody in East Brooklyn could be reading an article that and annotating it, and then somebody in Oakland could could be kind of reading the same article. So that's that's some of the, some of the possibilities. So could we just go around and hear other possibilities and things that you think are really important in this process, and try to keep it the one if you can. <laughs> Is that a fair way to go here? Tommy, go ahead. <laughs> what um, do you think? Okay. Of this part? Well, I I think in in my classes and the research project projects that I've done before. Um, I mean, I really struggle just trying to get the students to um, engage in finding interesting uh, material. Uh, um, and so I'm actually planning on using the Crocodoc um, site. With I'm going to try it with both my freshmen and my juniors to see uh, how it goes this year. Um, 
and I'm going to have them look at it pretty early, kind of in the idea generation process when they're still kind of um, doing the 10 uh, self and world questions. I might have them go in and look at it then to help them, you know, just discover some different ideas to think about. Um, so I'll, I'll know more about how the Crocodox works after uh, another month or so. By the way, nobody needs any more accounts or anything. You can just go in there and use it's a wide open space. Uh, right. With, with all the problems that that might cause. But, all right, Shantanu, wh what about you? What for you is most important in the research questioning process? Uh, well, for me, uh, the uh, most important is to uh, have the students uh, uh, focus on a topic and then read extensively in, in that topic. Uh, before uh, we're writing about it. So uh, I do encourage them to uh, read entire books before, uh, uh, before uh, embarking on, on their literacy tasks. Uh, but, but, but they often write while they're reading the book too, right? Right. They, they often write while they're reading, but uh, you know, uh, the literacy tasks aren't finished until they've read uh, two entire books, so uh, mm. uh, we were in the course of six weeks. So uh, yeah, that, that, that was an important thing for me to have them do. Uh, and in terms of uh, reading and annotating, you know, this year uh, uh, I was just introduced this year to, to Crocodax, and so I introduced it to my students. But I I don't think that they uh, spent a lot of time with that. Most of the kids decided to uh, take. Uh, articles that they found, print them out, and then annotate them manually. Mm -hmm. I think, and and this year I was uh, too busy with so many classes that uh, I haven't had time to try to uh, learn more about Crocodoc and uh, and uh, push it to uh, you know. Uh, but, that's great. Please don't feel like you have to respond to my thing with anything. <laughs> but no, um, it's, it's something that I I do plan on doing next year when I uh, hopefully yeah. have it. Lisa and Caitlin, let's come back to you at the end, if we don't, if you don't mind, Joe. What are, What are you thinking at this point? Um, I'm thinking uh, that the getting their research questions vetted by other grown-ups, um, the student perspective is really valuable because uh, they value that. I mean, they just they enjoy the that other kids actually can identify or can offer perspective. But we use it so that the, the are their teachers um, that other folks in the community can also push their questions because they do often come from a very personal space so they have to develop an, a level of objectivity about it and what gets them to get to that objectivity is actually hearing the voices of other people that are not personally immersed in the topic which I think is, is super valuable. So. And so who were those adults you got to do that? Oh man, um, okay so through the EDA work, all of the people at Mills, uh, we've got all of the networks that we've developed over the past 10 years with our senior project so a lot of folks from the community, our alumni, our old teachers that have left, you name it, we use them. We have a whole database full of folks that we draw from to judge our stuff. So and you just, you just the get the people. memberships on Youth Voices and then they can comment. Yeah. Or, or they even comment just with their, yeah. their email address. Yep. Or they comment and not. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Nice addition there. Chris Sloan, what do you think? Um, I was uh, helping someone in the chat room with a Youth Voices technical question. Uh, I lost track of this question. Sorry. What's what? so? And and Joe, I wanted I wanted you to talk at another time. We'll have to ask about what, like what what are field research. So so Chris, one of the things I noticed here, I'm going to pose a particular question to you. One of the things I noticed you doing is um, using databases, using Twitter, using Google. Um, you know, so. And, and I've done that too. Um, I wanted to ask you what your thinking was on that. Is it that the, those resources have different kinds of materials available and different kinds of texts and, and media? Or what's your thinking about um, asking them? You, last week you said you throw a lot at them. Um, asking them to do different research in different places. Right. So, you know, most of my students, like I suspect a lot of students and probably humans, um, just like when I do a search, it's like Google search. Google hit my search. Most kids' first set of results, maybe the first four, they're going to find something that they want to use, kind of relating back to what you said, like just reading enough. 
And so, um, so that's one of my thoughts. And and another, like with Twitter, especially, is um, sometimes they they only use Twitter as um, you know just a social connection, which is great um, with their friends. And so my point there is there are a lot of resources for your research topic. Um, people are putting links to um, you know real time information that I don't know that they'd come across on the main Google page. Um, so that's why I use something like Twitter. Um, I teach them advanced search operators in Google to try to make their searches better. And then the reason I do databases, pr password protected databases, is that you know, like my school and my public library pays for those things, so they might as well use them. And uh, you know, those are curated by humans, and therefore, again, I think they get different results. It does. It's not like it only exists in those places, but that. They get different results in different places, and you know maybe the lesson is that they know to look in different places to find different things. Yeah, yeah. and you you have in the past. I don't know if you're going to do it this year, but you've had students look for experts on Twitter to mm -hmm. communicate with as well, right? Right. So, so they've done that, and they've sent their um, messages to people, and they're starting to hear back from some. Cool. I'm sorry to be rushing here, but Charlie, what are you thinking? Uh, the main thing in research is this idea, and I've only had it happen a few times, but it's really the best, is the idea of uh, being an expert. So a lot of times you'll get people who choose a question and then just put that question away and then choose something different, or they start reading, but you know the student that actually continues to research different aspects of that same you know, uh, obsession, whatever it might be that, that really drives them, but that they actually leave feeling like an expert and can easily talk to anyone in their class about their topic. That's, That's cool. That's yeah, yeah. Amal? Um, well, I'm, I'm super jealous of Chris's uh, ability to use Twitter in his classroom and have students uh, communicate and reach out to experts that way. And i am noticed Paul lurking in the background of my students' writing um, and loving it, and <laughs> Crocodoc has long been on my list of things to explore, and I think I'm actually going to try to, um, I guess it shouldn't be too hard to teach it to myself and incorporate it into my classroom a lot more. Um, worth mentioning, so worth mentioning I, the hope is that it, it is a co-created space that kids find yeah. stuff to add there too. Um, and there is a video right on the membership at the bottom of the membership page that yeah. explains how to do it. But anyway, sorry. No, you're fine. Um, and so yeah, so that's those are things I'm really excited about and having students um, I haven't really done this before where I have students collaborate on each other's research projects. They've all kind of mm. gone independently and in their own directions and there's been such great value to that that I've sort of I guess ignored a little bit how much value there would also be in having them collaborate and help each other, even if it is not the topic that they are passionate about, to just kind of see what other kids are working on is really inspiring to them. And so that's, I think, a really great way to do that. How long do you have to do this research project? Um, I'm, I'm planning on doing it through May, um, and the kids are just starting, and I've um, in previous years, not spent as much time on the one topic. I've kind of allowed them to explore different topics, and this year I'm kind of uh, coming down on them to kind of commit and have endurance and become experts on the topic that they've chosen, and I am uh, already really grateful that I'm doing that. That's, I think, going to be a lot more rewarding for all of them. Cool. All right, we might have lost um, Kate, Caitlin, um, but but I think, Lisa, you're still here. Do you, I wanted to come back to you at the end. Um, welcome to this community. Um, I love these people around us here. So <laughs> thank you. Um, and, and so, but what are, your th what are your thoughts at this point? Um, I mean, coming off of my experience with this research project last year, um, I think there have been three kind of front runners of what I've been focusing on. So. Mm -hmm. I spent the first semester really focusing on um, uh, writing structure 
like just the structure of writing, compose, like how to piece together information to form an argument, so that when we got to the research work that we're doing, that we're just starting right now, um, when they have all of this complex information that they're trying to digest, they feel a little more confident in how to piece it together into a piece of writing. So, um, can, I, can, I, can I just jump and say the guides tab is yeah. all about that? And, and one of the thoughts I've had is that we could create text structure, kind of more visual things than those guides are, but go yeah. ahead. Yeah, a lot so. of the guides that I've looked at um, mm -hmm. seem, oh, seem to be um, like sentence frames, like a, a mm -hmm. bunch of sentence frames strung together, which I, I like for certain purposes. What I've been trying to do is getting them to become really familiar with a particular outline that we just keep adding so we, you know, we we just started talking about how to use multiple pieces of evidence um, to corroborate and contradict each other. So that's that's one focus, and then another focus is um, finding sources of information that are particularly relevant and credible, um, not just any source of information that you know doesn't really doesn't really form, doesn't really help them form a, a compelling argument. So the, um, the credibility and the reliability of sources has been a focus and what I've been realizing is that um, you know the reason that I and many of us I think know how to find relevant sources of information is because we have such a wealth of background knowledge going into any topic even if we're not super well versed on it. We, we know, we have a much better sense of where to start um, with finding information and so that's another focus that we're going to be looking at is like I'm going to kind of just start sharing with them you know different sources of information that are good starting points you know start with newspapers start with this start with that so those are my three kind of things that I'm really trying to focus on this year and I think it's going to turn out to be a based on the information I've found so far here's what I can argue rather than a I've researched this extensively um, and I'm an expert, but that's, that's this year. Early and often is what I'd love to say. We've learned um, to have kids publish early and often about their research projects. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, this is what I know now, and here are my questions now, and then, you know, and then when that happens every two weeks, it's, it becomes really interesting. Um, I hope it's really obvious that um, the other thing that we are all doing is we're we're getting public about how we do this, um, and when we see each other's work and the students' work, that kind of reminds us of other possibilities and so forth too. So thank you all for sharing some of that here tonight. I'm going to give you all a break so you can leave us, get back to your families and all. Um, <laughs> Unless I may, oh, is there a Thursday Youth Voices Live happening, guys? Uh, yes. Chris and Joe. Okay. Yeah. And you guys have some sort of plan. And anybody who wants to figure out how that works, in my New York City public school, um, Google Hangouts works. So um, that might be a possibility, by the way. Yeah, there's um, actually, I think, a Thursday and Friday this week. Paul. There's a Thursday yes. and Friday. Okay. So, and have you guys figured out Creative Commons yet on you on YouTube? If not, it's in it's in the advanced uh, settings. I'll send you a, a a picture of it, so we can awesome. bring all that together. Okay, so thank you all. Um, we um started teachers teaching teachers are around conversations just like this one, um, several years ago. Um, and this is show three eighty five. Thank you all for um joining us joining us tonight. We started um, at the edtechtalk.com um, channel of the World Bridges Network with Jeff Lebo and Dave Cormier. Thank you all. And um, Lisa, I'll see you tomorrow or Friday. I'll get there late tomorrow night. Um, I'm going to get, get to up to DML as well in, in Boston. So thank you all. Good night. Thank, thank you. you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night.